Uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, should anyone not know me, um, my name is Wayne. I'm part of the leadership team here at Longmeadow. We're going to, uh, follow in this first part of our service, uh, we're going to follow through Psalm 81. And this is how it begins. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music, strike the timbrel, play the melodious harp and lyre. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon and when the moon is full on the day of our festival. This is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. When God went out against Egypt, he established it as a statute for Joseph. See, gathering to sing and to make music and to praise the Lord was a statute for Israel, something that they should have been doing regularly as they gathered. And that is our pattern as well when we gather on Sunday mornings, isn't it? We rejoice in making music, however we're able to do that, uh, and, uh, and sing and praise God. So we're going to do that in our first song. We are going to stand and we are going to praise the Lord, the one who has uh, done all things for us. Let's stand and sing. standing and pray. Father, we thank you for the wonder of being able to come before you in worship and praise, to be a part of that great worship of, of you, the one who is strong and true and wonderful and who sustains all of creation. Father, pray that we will daily see the wonders of your grace and your mercy to us. Pray that we will wake each morning and be grateful for the way that you sustain and provide the things that we need day to day in our lives. Father, pray that our lives would ever more be shaped uh, of, in worship and praise and adoration of you. Amen. Uh, do stay standing. Um, so Psalm 81 opens with that reference to the God of Jacob, reminding the people of, of uh, the God who has been faithful for generations, who has called people out of, out of nowhere and made a great people of them. And our next song does the same thing at the beginning. It Paul's on the idea of the God of Abraham. So we have that same idea of God, the one who has been faithful for ages past. But this uh, hymn also looks to the future. It looks for the great hope for his people. And we get in a couple of verses time that we shall behold his face and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. So let's continue to sing now, wondering at the great promises that God has in store. Oh, oh, oh. 
you take your seats. Uh, we've got a few notices uh, before we go any further. We've got an extra bonus one uh, in the form of Broadwater Day. So hopefully you're all aware that tomorrow is Broadwater Day, the second coming. Um, if you don't know any details of it, there are uh, flyers out in the foyer. So grab them, hand them around, whatever. We do have some gaps currently in our manning of our stall for the day. So given that it's tomorrow, it's quite urgent that if people can fill them, they can. Um, so if anyone knows that they are available tomorrow afternoon and could come for an hour and stand at table, um, if you know that now, could you kind of signal? If you don't know that now, could you please check your diaries and come up and stick a name on here if you possibly can? So that'd be really great so that we can man our stall tomorrow. Um, other notices. Um, oh, 108 Oaks Cross. So you may have noticed the development going on across the road. Um, so this is a, um, a council project. They're putting in um, 11 modular housing units. And the idea is that homeless folk would have somewhere to stay that is much more pleasant than where they are at the moment. Um, we're keen to provide welcome packs for anyone who would like to receive one as they move in. Um, and I believe folk are the first people will be moving in within the next two or three weeks. Um, Gemma is going to coordinate this, so work out what needs to be provided and, and organise the getting together. But she would like to not have to do the whole thing herself. So if anyone could help out with that, this might be in the form of doing a little bit of shopping, picking up the bits they needed. It might be in the form of packing boxes. It might be in delivering stuff to people. Um, then do please, um, you can either let me or Ben or Gemma know that you'd like to be involved. Also, if you have any sturdy boxes to pack things in, just be nicer than giving them a carry bag, um, she would love to receive those as well. So not probably not anything particularly large, probably just slightly over shoebox size. Um, we've also got coming up soon our end of summer party. Uh, so this is kind of a mini family fun day, uh, just to invite folk in, uh, families and children to join and have fun. Uh, we have plenty of space for folk to volunteer and help out at this if you haven't done so already. Um, so we'd love to have people to help both in the setup and with sitting on a, uh, sitting on a craft table or a games table and with tidying up afterwards. So if you think you can help with any of those things on the 4th of September, uh, then do please let Miriam know about that. And then our final notice is coming from Gillian. Hey, morning. This is for the ladies among the congregation. There's quite a lot of ladies, I have to say, this morning. Brilliant. OK, um, ladies of Longmeadow are starting a new, um, I'm not going to call it a prayer meeting, because we're saying it's fellowship in prayer. I don't want you to think of things sitting really bored in a prayer meeting. Some people may have that impression. This is not going to be like that. We're going to be getting down to really deep praying to our loving Heavenly Father. We're going to get to know him better. We're going to get to know each other better praying together. And so if you're not used to prayer meetings and you think, oh, no, I don't fancy that, come and give it a go, ladies, please. It's going to be, well, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really passionate. But hopefully it's going to be a really passionate prayer time to our God and the Father and to Jesus. And, yeah, please come along. Friday, 9.30 here. Um, we're going to do the first Friday of every month, see how it goes till Christmas. Hopefully, it'll carry on after that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, uh, Gillian, sorry. <laughs> we're going to continue on through uh, Psalm 81. I heard an unknown voice say, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress, you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of the thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear me, my people, and I will warn you. If you would only listen to me, Israel, you shall have no foreign gods amongst you. You shall, uh, you shall not worship any god other than me. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open up your mouth wide, uh, open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. They're great reminders of how God had been faithful to them practically over the years. How he had heard their calls of distress in Egypt and how he had acted and saved them. And this was a story that they were to tell their children and their children's children and their children's children's children throughout the generations, that they would never forget God's faithfulness. And that's a pattern that we seek to follow as we meet week by week in the songs that we sing, where we seek to pick songs that tell us of God's wonder, of how we spend time in the Bible. And also a way we do that is through um, learning and reciting creeds together. 
So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to read together the Apostles' Creed. That clear statement on who God, the Father, Son and Spirit are and how they have been involved in our salvation. So let's declare these truths together, shall we? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Or well, we're going to stand and sing now a song that declares those truths to us, that reminds us how Christ came down and faced the cross on our behalf and won eternal life for us. Let's stand and sing. Psalm 81. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own desires. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the, with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. There's that sad truth that despite God's faithfulness since the time of Jacob, 
Despite his faithful rescuing of the people from Egypt and standing by them throughout the time after that, that still they forgot to listen and follow. And so in Israel's time meant they faced exile of being cut off from God and the temple and the promised land. And we might not fail to listen in quite the same way as they did, but it's true for us as well, isn't it? That we see God's faithfulness in our lives. We know that he has called us and made us a part of his people. And yet so often we find it all too easy to forget and to drift off into other things. But that promise at the end still applies, doesn't it? But you would be, le- uh, but you would be fed with finest wheat and honey from the rock I would satisfy you. That's, that's the hope for God's people. Even though they have walked away, but there is still opportunity for them to have these wonderful blessings in the land. We find a very similar similar, uh, sentiment uh, echoed in John 10. Is Jesus saying, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. There's that reassurance that if we are part of Jesus' flock, if we are counted among his sheep, that that we might for a time fail to heed well his voice. We will listen. We will be called back and we will end up following again. No one can take us away from him. We have that sure and certain promise of eternal life. We're going to pray now. We're going to confess those times when we fail to listen, when we drift away from God. And we're going to rejoice that despite that, that we are held firm and that hope of eternal life with Christ still applies to us. Let's pray now. Father, it's so easy when we read the Old Testament, perhaps, to see how foolish your people were of how they squandered those wonderful gifts that you gave them and just went into utterly foolish ways of following foreign gods and putting other things before you. But it's true that each of us does that. We have priorities that sneak in, that um, interfere with the way that we uh, spend time talking to you and spend time in your word and spend time serving and loving your people. So, Father, uh, we come openly and confessing those times that we have failed to listen and to heed you well. Father, please forgive us for our uh, ongoing uh, rebellion day by day. Forgive us those times that we have failed to love others, where we have failed to love you. But Father, we wonder at your mercy, at your faithfulness, even in the light of all of that. Thank you for those promises in John, that if we are amongst your sheep, then though we wander, you will always draw us back, that we are firm and safe in your hand, and that one day we will spend eternity in your presence. Father, thank you for that. those wonderful promises. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again now a song that uh, is, a, is really a plea for God to work in our hearts and to cause us to love and listen to him better. It's a call for the Holy Spirit to be active and changing us and making us more Christ-like. Let's stand and sing now.
please take seats. We're going to spend a bit of time now praying for our world. So we're going to think about things that are quite near. Um, so I'm sure it's not passed anyone by the increase in the energy price cap and the gloomy forecast of where that's going to go. These pressures on folks' cost of living and just what that's going to mean for many people over the next six months or so. The anxiety and hardship that's going to be faced. We're going to think slightly further afield uh, of... Uh, the ongoing asylum seeker situation and folks who are risking lives across the channel and regardless of where we lie on what we think the right response to this is I think it's fairly clear that as things stand things are not working well and the people are risking and undoubtedly losing their lives and falling uh, prey to people traffickers to get them across uh, and uh, thinking slightly further afield from that uh, we recently had the news of, of Ukrainian Independence Day, which um, mercifully didn't see any large-scale attacks. But six months on, and the conflict is still going, and there's no immediate sign of anything changing in that. So we're going to uh, spend some time praying for those three things now. Let's pray. Father, we pray for uh, the people of our nation and the hardships that we're all looking to face coming over the next few months of prices of everyday essentials going up and of energy costs spiraling up seemingly out of control father we're going to be uh, hard pressed ourselves in the midst of that and probably face difficult times father pray that we would um, continue to know that you do make that promise of providing daily needs Pray that we continue to know your, your daily presence and providing in that. And pray that as your people, we wouldn't turn inward. Pray that though things might be hard for us, we'd continue to have a heart for those outside of the church. Pray that we'd continue to look for ways that uh, maybe we can provide support or warm spaces or um, maybe just a shoulder to cry on and a sympathetic ear. Father, we... Uh, pray for all of those who are going to find themselves facing that choice of food or heating this winter father we pray that many will be acting uh, uh, to try and work in the midst of these hard times thinking especially for organizations like cap that will uh, i'm sure be called upon even more than they are currently as things go forward father pray that your church would be characterized by uh, having a a deep compassion and desire to help wherever we can. Father, we think to the situation going, across, uh, going on with migrants trying to cross the channel and asylum seekers trying desperately to get here. Father, it's with deep sadness that we think of the situations around the world that are robbing people of their homes and safety and causing them to embark on such a perilous journey. We mourn to think of just how many people are trying to cross that dangerous stretch of water entirely unequipped and often having been taken advantage of by people traffickers who are knowingly putting them at such vast risk. Father, we don't know what the right answer to this is, but we pray that uh, governments here and in Europe would be motivated, motivated by compassion in their response. Pray that they would want primarily to see lives saved and people made safe. Pray that those people traffickers would be denied the audience and the, uh, the clientele that they want. Pray that steps may be able to take and to, um, uh, to keep folk, uh, to find safe homes for people who have been dispossessed and to do that in a safe way. And Father, we think of the continuing war in Ukraine where things seem to have uh, bogged down into almost a stalemate. Father, we pray for your mercy amongst that situation. We do uh, yearn and long that that war would end soon. But in the midst of it, Father, pray that you'd have mercy on those who, are, uh, who have been dispossessed and are finding themselves living daily in fear of when the attack, next attack might come. Father, thank you that we know that there are uh, various groups of your people at work there to provide um, aid and comfort 
and help for those who want to get out of the country. Father, pray that you continue to work through your people there. Pray that in the midst of, of a very deep uncertainty, that they would be able to stand out as beacons certain of the hope that they have in you. Amen. Well, the children are going to leave us for their groups during our next song. I think we have a full complement of groups running. Um, so, yeah, anywhere up to Ignite, uh, you uh, can head out. And just before Ben comes up and speaks to us, uh, we're going to uh, stand and sing a, a fine old hymn that reminds us of just how great God's word is and what a wonderful gift he has given, in, given us to that, just as we prepare to hear where Ben speak from it. Uh, so, children, you can head off now. Everyone else, let's stand and sing. <laughs> for your faithful love. We pray today that you'd show us more of your power and compassion and lift our eyes to what you're doing throughout history and across the world, that we would each play our part without fear. Amen. If you take a seat, please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 54 as we continue in our series. Page 742 if you have one of the church Bibles. While he turned there, let me tell you a story about Jane. She was a, a lady who'd come to Christ very late in life. Um, and she had no family, and very poor health. This new Christian was stuck at home. She couldn't actually get to church. She wondered what her legacy would ever be. But a neighbor would visit to help occasionally and would bring her son along. And neither of these neighbors were Christians. They didn't seem to have any real interest. But Jane would pray and pray for the neighbor and the little boy, Jim. She invited them to a church event, the Holiday Bible Club. Uh, they refused the first time. The next year, they also refused. But on the third year, Jim went. Although, actually, it seemed to make very little difference in his life. And then Jane died, seemingly with absolutely no legacy. Had she made any impact in the world? Well, little Jim had heard about Jesus. And years later at university, his interest in Jesus was ignited. And soon he gave his life to Christ. 
Jim went on to become a teacher and he threw himself into the school Christian Union. And wonderfully that grew and prospered and many school pupils became Christians and found great peace and joy in their saviour. Many became influential Christians in the workplace and at home, and some even went on to become gospel workers in various co other countries. Now, if you drew up a family tree, Jane's influences went all over the world. She may have had no children of her own, but Jim was a spiritual son, and through him she had many spiritual grandchildren. And do you know what? If we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a legacy too. We will have an impact by God's grace. Lasting meaning is guaranteed for each follower of Christ because God will be glorified through each of his children. Last week, we uh, looked at the climactic Old Testament prophecy about Jesus, Isaiah 53. He's the servant of the Lord who is despised and executed. But his death is not a tragedy, rather it's designed by God to take away our sin. For on the cross, Christ took the punishment that our rebellion deserved. And the result is tremendously good news. And we begin to see it unpacked in Isaiah 54. And the message today is this, flourish without fear. Flourish without fear. Now remember, Isaiah was originally written to God's people in exile in Babylon. Why were they there? Well, Wayne has already intimated that. The first block of Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39, explained the sin of God's people. They had been unfaithful. They should have loved God, who loved them so much. They should have respected their Savior as number one in their lives. But they chose to chase the idols of surrounding nations instead. But the middle block of the book of Isaiah is all about the servant of the Lord, Jesus. Chapters 40 to 55 proclaim God's sovereign control over all of history and his gracious rescue for people from all nations through his servant. But it's very difficult to believe God's astonishing promises. The Jewish people in exile were still reeling from their punishment. And our chapter today gives us three powerful pictures of their miserable state. Uh, we'll see the final picture is of a ruined city. In the middle of the chapter, we've got a disgraced wife. But in verses 1 to 3, the people of God are depicted as a childless woman. People with no legacy whose purpose seemed to be empty. However, what God says to this hopeless people is mind-blowingly wonderful. Verses 1 to 3. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, don't hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. In other words, rejoice. This family will grow. Pretty hard to believe when you're far from home and your tent is empty. That was the situation for God's beloved bride, the people of Israel. For them, the glorious nation, the happy family of God, seemed to be dead. They groaned and lamented like barren women without children. They felt entirely without purpose, with no legacy. But God says, stop lamenting, sing and shout. A new miracle family is on the way. So get ready, verse 2. Stretch out your tent. Lengthen its ropes to its fullest extent. As we might say, get a bigger car. Get a loft conversion. My people, you're going to see supernatural growth that goes beyond mere biology. And that was fulfilled in part when a little remnant of Jews returned to Israel. In 538 BC, under Persian rule, 42,000 Jewish people 
went home to rebuild. And they began to grow once more in the promised land. But you know what? They didn't spread out to possess the nations around. And so verse 3 was, was not quite fulfilled in those days in their return. All this awaited a bigger fulfillment. Thankfully, the Old Testament always pointed to something bigger in Jesus. For example, Psalm 2, verse 8 says, Christ would have the nations as his inheritance. We also saw it last week in the final servant song. As a result of his death, 53, verse 10, Jesus would have offspring, descendants. And in verse 12, he has apportioned many people well, who are these? Who are the offspring of Jesus? The Apostle Paul applies those promises to the church across the world. And actually, Paul quotes Isaiah 54, verse 1, in full in Galatians 4, 27. It's clear. The disciples of Jesus across the globe are this new family of God, growing all the time, supernaturally. Islam may be growing, but it's only really through biological reproduction. Christianity is growing because people are spreading the message of the cross of Christ. We proclaim that message of a crucified saviour. It may seem foolish to some, and they would dismiss the gospel of Jesus. But to others, this is the perfect display of the wisdom and power of God. And every second, one new believer is born again into God's worldwide family. So rejoice. You will have a legacy. In Christ, you will have eternal significance. Make room, get ready. The family of Jesus is just going to keep on growing. Now, over 230 years ago, the church had lost sight of this. The Baptist Union, for example, was sliding into hyper-Calvinism. That is, they rightly believed that God chooses people and saves them, but they wrongly concluded that we therefore have no part to play. Just let God get on with it. The Baptist churches in England were sending zero missionaries. Now, a humble shoemaker in Northamptonshire was distraught about this. How on earth could we be so keen to spread the British Empire with all its evils, but not the gospel of the eternal Christ? Oh, he got up and he preached one of the top 10 sermons in human history. And he urged a local gathering of church leaders to get off their backsides and to send missionaries so that the nations could hear the gospel. I wonder what Bible passage you would have chosen. He chose Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3. Enlarge the place of your tent. You will spread out to the right and to the left. And the very next day, those leaders drew up plans to form the Baptist Missionary Society. And their first missionary was that preacher that they heard that day, the cobbler William Carey. Nicknamed the father of modern missions. Why? Because after him, came over two centuries of missionary endeavor. And uh, he himself had no small influence in India. He uh, translated the Bible into Bengali, Oriya, Marathi, Hindi, Assamese, and Sanskrit. He also translated parts of it into 29 other languages and dialects. This guy had a huge spiritual influence. And the church in many places across the world that were once very dark now vastly outnumbers and sends more missionaries than all of Europe put together. William Carey's sermon that day had a parting message that still inspires many today. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things because God has promised that this family will grow. Attempt great things because even the smallest gospel seed that you plant can bring new life and transform whole communities and nations. To paraphrase the words of Jesus in Matthew 13, 
a mustard seed will become a mighty tree in which the nations take refuge. The gospel will spread throughout the globe like yeast through a small lump of dough. So don't sit there with your head in your hands as if the church must die, as if you'll never have any influence. No, rejoice. God's kingdom cannot fail. His word cannot be changed. Whoever you are, you have a legacy. Your life can impact this world. Through you, God will cause his family to expand. Do you believe it? It's the promise of God. In Isaiah's era, to the Jews facing disgrace in exile, those words seemed fanciful because they were justly suffering under God's wrath. And so God heartens them. Great encouragement in the middle of chapter 54. God says, don't fear. Don't fear. Mercy triumphs over judgment. As a result of Christ's sacrifice, you have no need to fear God's wrath anymore. Verse 4, do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood or perhaps abandonment. For the Lord hadn't died and left Israel as a widow. Rather, from her earliest days in Egypt to the tragedy of exile in Babylon, God's people had been unfaithful and he had justly forsaken them. But now he says, don't fear. And just look who says that in verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. A holy one of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Who was it that made you a people? It's the Lord Almighty who married you, the loving Redeemer, sovereign over the whole earth. And his redeeming love reached even sinners in pagan Babylon. You see, God would send this servant who would deliberately die in their place. We read it last week, chapter 53, verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. The result is this very happy message, verses 6 to 8. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit, a wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, just anger, remember, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So God calls his bride back to himself to enjoy his rich love and loyalty. And thankfully, the promise doesn't depend on her works. Israel was barren and unfaithful. She could not restore what was defiled. And nor can we mend our broken relationship with God. But Jesus fixes things. The victorious servant of the Lord heals the rift and buys us back. That's how mercy triumphs over judgment. And now we enjoy this divine love that will never let us go. One writer personalizes God's affection for us. God loves each of us as if there were only one of us to love. I wonder if you heard the story of the Romeo Rufa, Dale McLaughlin. A week before Christmas, Dale desperately wanted to see his girlfriend, Jessica Radcliffe. But, but he lived up in Scotland and she lived in the Isle of Man. And so <laughs> he bought himself a jet ski. Um, no, he'd barely ridden one before. Um, but he set off very hopefully at 8 a.m. on a Friday morning for what he hoped would be a 40 minute ride over just 15 miles of sea heading south to the Isle of Man. However, the weather got very rough and he arrived almost five hours later. 
with only 10 minutes of fuel left in his tank. He then had to work a walk a further 15 miles down to her town, and she had no idea he was coming. What a lovely Christmas surprise. However, the local police were not impressed at this illegal immigrant, and they arrested him that Sunday. But Jessica said, look, I had a man cross the Irish Sea for me on a jet ski. I don't know one other woman who can say that. He must really love me. Well, God's love is, a, is of a completely higher order, isn't it? God goes further than the Isle of Man. He bridges the gap between heaven and earth. The gap between a faithful God and an unfaithful people. Although he is so clearly wronged, he renews his marriage to his bride. And to pay for that, Christ was abandoned so that we might re be received back forever. Even though we keep turning away to material things and to other people, even though we stupidly search for meaning and love and value in all the wrong places, our maker remains our husband and he loves us more than any other. And though we are broken and dirty, he says, my love never ends, you're mine. And his mercy means this rock-solid commitment, no matter what. Just look again at the second half of verse 8. These are beautiful words. With everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Verse 9, to me this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Pretty amazing. You remember all the wickedness of mankind during the days of Noah. And you remember that God saved for himself a few people, Noah's family, in this floating zoo, the ark, as he sent the floodwaters to wash all the wickedness of humanity away. But remember then, God hung up his war bow, not downwards, but upwards. This rainbow in the sky guarantees that the waters of judgment are coming no more. And the suffering of the servant of the Lord that we saw last week guarantees no more judgment for God's people. In its place is this rock-solid marriage. Verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, the most solid things you can imagine, they may pass away. Yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. We are that loved by the maker of heaven and earth. So, no need to fear. Instead, draw near. Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us then draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. We know that our sins have been paid for. We know we're never going to face God's wrath ever again. Well, then don't hang back despondent about your waywardness. Look to Jesus with his arms open wide and enjoy his love. Listen to his promises day by day. Trust him and talk to him. Enjoy that loving relationship. You will know his divine affection and his unfailing compassion. One final glorious promise to God's people from Isaiah 54. God says, I am giving you peace and security. This is wonderful news for a people who are broken by invasion, like a ruined city. There's a glorious reversal from verse 11. Afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted. I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I'll make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught 
by the Lord, and great will be their peace. Now in the Old Testament, Zion, Jerusalem, was the city of God. But now God is remaking his city across the world with kaleidoscopic colours. To him, we're becoming this whole range of beautiful gemstones. See, God is at work in every church. We may not look like very much, but a marvel is under construction. You are becoming as beautiful as turquoise, ruby, sparkling jewels. That's what God is making here. Why? Verse 13. All your children will be taught by the Lord. He personally instructs us such that we have peace. And great will be their peace. Funnily enough, that instruction and peace we find in the Lord Jesus. Just listen to how Jesus himself applies this verse in John chapter 6, verse 44. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, in Isaiah actually, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who's heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. So how can you tell if you're one of these people taught by God? You can tell if you've come to Jesus. If the Father has drawn you to his Son, then you have a peace with God, leading to a peace within this new family. Romans 4 says we have peace with God, no more war with him. And Ephesians 2 says we now have peace here, even with former enemies. Even the age-old chasm between Jews and non-Jews is bridged. Together we enjoy peace. And it's an internal peace too, a comfort within. Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7 says that God gives us a peace that surpasses understanding. How do you get that peace from God? Well, Philippians 4 says we get it as we talk to God, as we pray. Peace with God, peace with each other, and as we trust our Father with every situation, great is our peace. We can trust him so confidently because he gives us security, eternal security. This is a great promise as we read the end of Isaiah 54, verse 14. <clears throat> In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You'll have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. And yet God's people might, might think, well, hang on, what if we get attacked again? What if we get exiled again? Well, see what God says in verse 15. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. After all, God is sovereign over all human skills and plans. Verse 16, see it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. It is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now, vindication is another word for righteousness. Our heritage from God is righteousness because Christ has justified us. It's what we saw last week in chapter 53, verse 11. These promises, you see, flow straight out of the work of Christ. In him, we are right with God. And we will live lives that reflect that standing. And others will be drawn in. Those that may accuse us will realize that righteousness is available in Christ. Here's an actual application from 1 Peter 2. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, 
they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now for sure, as you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, people may accuse you of doing wrong. But some will come to realize that God is at work in you. And they will listen to the message of Christ. Repent and give glory to God. This is uh, Rosaria Butterfield. She wrote a memoir about her journey to Christ from being a committed and quarrelsome lesbian. The book's called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. As a non-Christian, she, she said her impression of evangelical Christians was that they were poor thinkers, judgmental, scornful and afraid of diversity. And so she wrote a critique of an evangelical group in her local newspaper. And then she re received an enormous volume of polarized responses. She put an empty box in each corner of her desk and she sorted the hate mail into one box and the fan mail into the other box. But then she received a two-page response from a local pastor. And she says it was a kind, and inquiring letter. It had a warmth and civility to it, in addition to its probing questions. But she couldn't figure out which box to put it in. And so this letter sat on her desk for seven days. She says, it was the kindest letter of opposition I've ever received. Its tone demonstrated that the writer wasn't against her, but for her. Eventually, she contacted the pastor and she became friends with him and his wife. She enjoyed many meals, both laughter and serious conversation. She says, they talked with me in a way that didn't make me feel erased. And that friendship was an important part of her journey to faith. And soon, Rosaria embraced Christ as her Lord and Saviour such peace and comfort she found with him that she could never believe. Well, let me encourage you then to flourish in Christ without fear. You will have a legacy as you live for him. You need not have fear as you draw near to him day by day. And you can respond to a skeptical world with courage and gentleness. Because you know that you have peace and security in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you so much that this, your family, is growing across the world. Help us to expect great things of you. And so to attempt great things for you. Though the church in the UK may be growing very slowly. We bless and praise you that as people attempt great things across the world, it is rapidly expanding. And yet, Lord, in our daily lives, we often feel dejected. How small and weak we are. Please reassure us of your unfailing love. And please go on transforming us by the righteousness of Christ, that we would display your goodness and kindness in our everyday working life, in our home life, our leisure, so that many around us realise Jesus is Lord and give you the glory. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last song, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Stand and sing.
Well, let's pray this prayer for one another together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Can you take a seat?